Welcome back to the Celts Are Here podcast. We're joined by a very special guest this morning or this evening in Dan's case out there in Japan. Um, we're joined by journalist Dan Orlovitz from the Japan Times. Dan, I think it's about six o'clock your time. It's nine o'clock here. We're working within the different um, times of day, but how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Um, it's good, always good to, to reconnect with uh, you guys. And it's uh, an interesting week coming up for Japanese football fans and uh, Celtic fans who are interested in Japanese football. Absolutely. Um, I'm hoping to see a couple of Japan internationalists perform in front of me on Wednesday evening in the Bernabeu. And that's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, but we'd say just before we came on that you woke up to loads of tweets. You woke up to notifications. You thought, oh no, I've did something stupid. And it was a rumour about a, a player in the J-League possibly heading to Celtic. I've seen a lot of your threads on Twitter around it. Um, it looks as if this one's a goer. We're talking about Yuki Kobayashi. Give us your initial thoughts on this one. Uh, he's a really interesting, very defensive-minded selection. He's a centre-back uh, with Vissel Kobe, uh, 22 years old. Uh, has done very well these last couple of seasons. Uh, he spent the 2020 season on loan at Yokohama FC, uh, where he did very well uh, and helped them avoid relegation. Well, actually, didn't help them avoid relegation because there, there was no relegation in 2020. But he did very well on a team that, that very much overperformed expectations. And he's, I, I think he brings, he potentially brings a lot of what, Ange Postacoglu is going to be looking for in terms of contributing to the build-up. He's not necessarily a shot taker, but he can force turnovers. He can set up passes. He can move the ball forward. Uh, he's got very good tactical awareness. I think he's he's not he's not the kind of player who will rush into a tackle. I think he's very intelligent in that sense. He he is still young. He is prone to mistakes. I think we we saw that with the penalty he gave away against Kawasaki Frontale on Saturday, but that's nothing that good guidance and coaching can't fix. And I think in terms of young prospects, uh, players who we expect to make an impact going forward, be in the national team picture even, uh, he's certainly up there. So this is a very astute uh, bit of scouting from Celtic uh, if this goes through, which uh, by all counts, it looks like it will. Yeah, you touch on that. He's still young. I think he's actually younger than myself, which I don't really like at this stage that when there's players playing for your football team that are become younger than you, it's quite I will, a bad thing to come to I, terms with. I, I will tell you that reminds me of the first time I interviewed uh, past Japan international Takifu Sakubo, and I think by then he was half my age, and it doesn't feel good, and it gets worse going forward. So you can, mm. uh, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, not, not something I'm looking forward to, but as you mentioned, he's only 22. There has been a bit of confusion. Some people have thought, as you say, there's a few uh, Yuki Kobayashi's playing in the J League. It is a 22 year old born in 2000 that plays for, for Vissel Kobe. And of course, Celtic has that connection uh, with Vissel because a man who's just in our background there who scored for Celtic yesterday also transferred over. Um, so again, there's a working relationship there between Celtic and, and Vissel Kobe already. Yes, and, and that's why once these reports came out, uh, obviously Kyogo Furuhashi's transfer took everyone by surprise because there was nothing teasing that. We learned that when Vissel announced it. Mm. Uh, that was the, the best bit of business that any J-League club has done in the last decade or so in terms of not only just how much, how much money they got for Kyogo, but how tidy it was and there weren't rumors and there wasn't the anticipation and the build-up that especially we we, we saw with Daisen Maida, Reo Hatate, mm -hmm. uh, Yosuke Itaguchi. So for this to come the way it has, uh, the report seems pretty confident. I understand that uh, in, there's Scottish media who have sources on the Celtic side uh, who are reporting similar. So it looks like uh, with the J-League wrapping up on this coming Saturday, November 5th, uh, we're going to see it 
reach its conclusion fairly quickly. And uh, it's a good business. And I would imagine that he'll be over there to do his medical pretty quickly and, and start getting integrated ahead of the, the January transfer window and, and getting settled. Yeah, that is really interesting, that one, because we've obviously seen, as you mentioned, Kyogo came out the blue. I remember I was down in Liverpool on like, a short break doing Beatles' stuff and I woke up in the hotel room to see this tweet that Celtic had signed a, a Japanese international by the name of Kyogo for the hash and I thought, who is he? Um, a month later, I would be jumping about when he scored a hat-trick against Dundee at Celtic Park. And, you know, as you mentioned there, even the January one, I think, even maybe caught some people here by storm when we just saw the three players announced instantly. They'd appeared in Glasgow just before Hugmanay and they had that possible, kind of, I think it was a two-week period before the, the Hibs game kicked off to see them integrated in the life a wee bit here. Um, So it's interesting, you know, you mentioned the J-League wrap-ups coming. I find it kind of astonishing in many ways, Dan, that the consistency, particularly from Dyson Maeda, and Real Hitati, we yet to see Yusuke Deguchi to feature too much. We will have a short chat about them. But the consistency of players to come in, adapt to different culture, um, and still be you know as fit as a fiddle going towards the kind of back end of a season, I find it incredible. I, I think that those players, especially Maida, has been in, in the, was in the J League for several seasons uh, before he went to Scotland, and it is a tough league to be in and, and you've got 34 rounds league cup games you're playing through the summer when it gets very hot and humid and it, it's a it's a challenge uh not just for players for, for fans watching it for journalists covering it uh it can be a slog and, and i think that that the uh, japanese uh climate does tend to temper uh these players a bit and, and make them a little tougher uh, and it can really help them in terms of their adaptation. Uh, with Rudeo Hatate in particular, uh, the fact that he really came into his own at Frontale over these two seasons, which were, because of the pandemic, arguably the two most difficult seasons in the history of the J-League. And he came through all that and was an amazing contributor uh, to Kawasaki Frontale, and then with no rest went to... Celtic and and continue to contribute uh, to that team and yes he wasn't looking great near the end of last season but then he had the summer to rest and he's arguably been one of the best Japanese players in Europe these last three months so it, they have the, they have the stamina they will they're fit they are conditioned and uh, they're you know the those players are there for the long haul and, and there we're past uh, the sort of period where a Japanese player would go to Europe and play maybe one or two seasons and they just wouldn't hack it and they would go back to Japan. Uh, more and more we're seeing players go over there who are there for the long haul and they're going to be in Europe for five, 10 seasons, if not more. And we're starting to possibly see that in terms of, you know, I don't maybe want to use the, the, the phrase stepping stone, but there possibly is that um, for some of the, the, the boys coming from the G League into Scottish football um, to possibly get that opportunity at international level and, of course, test yourself at the Champions League level, which I think, especially for a guy like Rio Hitati, who I always keep rem reminding people, Dan, that he's only really been playing professional football for two years just due to the way the, the university system works and whatnot, that he is still learning um, his trade, his game, whatever. And at 24, I think you've still to see probably the best of him um, to come in years to come. Um, wherever that will be, I would like it to be at Celtic. Um, we'll come on to talk about him, uh, particularly in terms of Japan's World Cup squad. But just back to, to, to Yuki, um, from reports in Scotland anyway, um, I can clarify some of this, it appears that a formal offer has been made from Celtic's Park. Both clubs are in agreement um, and the player himself wants to go. Just in terms of the player himself wants to go, um, obviously I found it really, really interesting to hear uh, Ryo Hitati speak about Shinsuke Nakamura's impact on himself um, and kind of being that trailblazer for other people to go and follow. Uh, again, Celtic have built this culture in Durant's post Koglu, where I think any player from any nationality could feel comfortable coming into the dressing room. Um, it would be nice in the terms of anybody coming, that they, they feel welcome, they feel that they can integrate into the structure really quickly, no matter what part of the world you're from. Um, 
And again, as we kind of touched on there, players will be looking at Celtic as that potential place to be to firstly maybe get that international cap that they've, they've not had um, and play at Europe's top level. Unfortunately for, for Juki, that's not going to be uh, this season, but he'll have his eyes hopeful um, on featuring for Celtic in the Champions League next season if he makes that move over to Scotland. Absolutely. I, I think that you look at the, the fact that Hatate uh, has had this amazing, I mean, as you say, this is, this is his third year. So he's wrapping up three, three years because he would have had 2020, 2021, 2022. And that he is playing so well in the Champions League and might still not get some, I mean, we'll get into it, but, but it, it does show you the depth uh, that, that Japan has in, in terms of, of players who are going over there. And I think that, Celtic being known as a place where Japanese players can prosper. Uh, I would compare it to another stepping stone club, which, which is St. Troyd in, in Belgium, uh, which is owned by a Japanese company, DMM. Uh, and they've got a lot of Japanese players, including uh, former Japan stars, Shinji Okazaki, Shinji Kagawa, current national team goalkeeper, Daniel Schmidt. And that has been a stepping stone for players going to Europe uh, who then move on to, to, to bigger things. Uh, Takehiro Tomiyasu is one of, one of their former players. And it is also sort of a stepping stone back to Japan where you have Kagawa, Okazaki, older players who are getting one or two last seasons in Europe in, uh, before they go in. But I, I think with Celtic, the appeal is that, yes, they are playing in the Champions League. Even even were Celtic to only play in the Europa League, that's still a massive step. You're still getting continental football experience. You're still playing against uh, a number of other countries. You're 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 being noticed by scouts, uh, by sporting directors, and I, I think that Hatate, yet yes, Shunsuke made the mold. I think Shunsuke made it possible for all of this to happen, but. If Hatate ends up getting sold either this winter or next summer or for whatever, uh, that's the cycle that I think Celtic want to create, where they're bringing in these great young Japanese players and then turning around and selling them for 10, 20 times what they paid for. Uh, and if the best Japanese players see that and, and they say, well, we want to play at Celtic too, then you're going to keep that going for a long time. And that's, you know, I think the more the merrier and kind of getting into the, the the whole conversation around football and recruitment at this point in time. So much has been made, Dan, about Celtic trying to compete with teams like Real Madrid and RB Leipzig um, in terms of budgets and, and whatever else. And I think one of the things a lot of people will say, if you do want to compete at this level, your recruitment needs to be bang on. You need to, you know, go into markets that are possibly untapped. Um, and from everything you've said there... If Celtic can continue that cycle, that could be a, a part of success in being competitive and consistent at European football if you're operating in a market where fees aren't too high, you can operate in and bring in quality players because, you know, I feel really sorry for, for Ryusuke Adeguchi so far that we've not yet to see him feature too much. Um, but for every other player that's came in from the J-League being Kyogo, Dyson and, and Rio, all have made a, a huge impact. And if that cycle can continue that can be a real positive for Celtic going forward. It can be. And I think that if you, if, if Yosuke Idaguchi is the worst signing that Ange has made at Celtic, I think that Celtic have done very well. Uh, as I stated, when the signing happened, like, it, it was sort of a, a, a grab bag. I think there was sort of, there was enough upside to make sense. And even if it doesn't work, I don't want to say that I, I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that the club should be happy to throw a million euros away. Uh, but not every player can be successful, and I think that mm. if you're looking at the upside from Japanese players, that that's a good that's a good risk to take. And it just it might not work out with him. He may eventually come into his own and and produce, uh, but. I, I think that the club can do much worse than to keep t making bets like that because more often than not, uh, especially if their scouting is on point, which, as you said, it is, they're going to keep hitting. And all you need to do is hit once every two or three players. 
and you're in a good position. And, and in terms of Japanese players uh, over the last year, Celtic are three for four. And, and that's a really good record. Yeah, and if you continue that up um, in years to come, I think you'll be pretty happy if you're a Celtic fan because if you keep producing um, such good quality players and developing them, um, I still think that a guy like Kyogo, even though he's one of the kind of the older guys within the Celtic team, we've yet to see him really be at his best. Um, we've already spoken about Rio and Dyson's another one who at, at 24 is still developing and still probably getting used to um, European football and, and even Scottish football um, from an extent. So it's, it's good to have those guys within the squad. It's good to have them in the building. Um, and for a title push, they, they were absolutely integral last season, especially Rio and Dyson coming in um, late, if you will, second part of the season, whatever you want to call it. Um, both played a real integral part, and uh, along with Kyogo's uh, 20 goals. Um, another great goal yesterday, Dan. I don't know if you managed to see it, but it was a really mm-hmm. great goal, great finish. Um, and, you know, I think people... People have maybe been a bit harsh in Kyogo at, at times because he set such a high standard last year with, with hat tricks and and whatnot, and there's question marks from from some people around him and his finishing in the Champions League. But it was his ninth goal of the season yesterday. I think that experience in the Champions League for a guy of his age will, will even do him the world of good. I, it's. I think that there is a tendency among fans, and this isn't limited to Celtic fans, but of, of any team, is that sometimes you get so used to seeing greatness that when you only get good, you feel like you're losing something and like you're being cheated. And I won't say that's unfair, but I'll take good Kyogo over great. You know, a lot of players' greatness any day of the week. I, I think that he's done fantastically this season. Uh, the, the, the first Champions League campaign, yeah, I, I personally was a little disappointed that Celtic haven't done more with this campaign, especially not to get in a position to, to move on to the Europa League. But I think that there were a lot of positives that could be seen. I think that experience helps a lot in these situations. I think that the, for the when, for the players, you're looking for them to take those lessons away and, and to go back and come back stronger next time around. And I think that that's just part of what Ange does as a manager is that he's good at, he's good at getting players to buy into the process and then improving it, refining it, refining it until it works. And it's why I think a lot of people still keep saying, you know, trust the process in terms of where Celtic's at. And it was the, the club's first um, entry into Champions League football in five years. I think you're, you'd expect it to take some scalps along the way. There's a lot of Celtic fans, including myself, out there that's disappointed that we didn't make uh, more more steps forward to, to be in a position where you know we had European football after Christmas. But it's a learning curve. I think there's probably more frustration than possibly disappointment in it, Dan, um, that we got to Europe's Premier Elite competition having been out it so long and we didn't maybe put up a, a kind of fighting challenge that we maybe expected. I thought Celtic gave a pretty decent account of themselves in the group stages, um, but I think when the draw came out, Real Madrid aside, I think a lot of people were possibly looking at it and thinking, yeah, this is a great opportunity at this point in time, but not to be in that one. Um, just in terms of back to kind of re- re- recruitment, um, as you've mentioned, it's three out of four hits for Celtic in the, the G League so far. I think some people in, in Scotland possibly thought, yep, that's that market done. Celtic are out of it. They might look elsewhere. Ange Postacoglu has teased uh, the Iranian market and, and whatnot. But d- do you expect, you know, you, you spoke about that cycle. We see here a 22-year-old defender. Do you expect Celtic to keep returning to the G League with Ange's manager and possibly further afield if the day ever came that he's, he's not no longer at the football club? Why not? You know, you, you, you keep, if you take your fishing pole out to the river and you bring home a monster catch week after week, you keep coming to that spot until you don't catch any more fish. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, there are some good years and bad, and I think that they'll just have to be mindful that there are these cycles and, and the more successful Celtic are, it will make it harder for them because I think, more clubs are looking at Japanese players. There are 60 
at least Japanese players in top division clubs in Europe right now, 50 or 60, I think well over 60 or 70, if you're including the championship, Bundesliga to, you know, all, all um, Segunda, like if, if you, if you count the major second divisions, well over 70, uh, especially with, there are some really young players on second teams. There are some really young players in the reserves and, and that's only, that number is only going to keep going up. And I, I don't think it, it wasn't Celtic didn't invent uh, signing the, 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 the signing of, of good Japanese players at a budget, but they, they have accomplished the biggest success so far uh, in a way, sort of a greater success than say Takumi Minamino who did very well uh, at Salzburg and, and then Liverpool. did okay for Liverpool. Yeah. Not doing too great for Monaco, but you know, players like that are, are, are coming and they're going to keep coming. And the, the more of those players that emerge, you know, it's, there's going to be competition. So I think that the, the, the challenge will remain on Celtic to keep looking and, and to, to really make some aggressive and astute decisions. Uh, but it, it's easier than ever these days. So it's, it's really just about having the courage of your conviction and trying to find those really interesting players and going for them. Just in terms of, kind of price tag around this, what, what do you expect it to be? And do you think that, obviously Kyogo, I think it's around four, four and a half million Celtic mm-hmm. pays for him. Do, do you think the G League will possibly, whether it's this season or in years to come, um, possibly look at what, what they're selling players for and start to, to, to rise those costs? Because certainly that's been something in Scottish football where, you know, they kind of, maybe 15 million, then it's now up, went up to 25 million, with mm-hmm. Kieran name of so that kind of, that trend followed it. You expect to see something like that in the, the J League in years to possibly come, Dan, that, that uh, as players maybe continually go to European football and th- there's that step maybe taken now that there's a confidence that, that big clubs, um, I know you've mentioned over 60 or 70 players that are at kind of top, top tier teams, um, they make that transition right in. Do you think the league in terms of clubs within the league might look at it? And the sense that you know we need to be putting bigger price tags in these guys. Well, they should. I mean, this is something I've been advocating for as a fan, as a writer, for year. We've we've been having this conversation for well over a decade, and there there's there are cultural issues there, uh, in, in terms of how clubs structure their contracts. There's issues because when they're signing players to professional contracts, they are still technically minors because the age of adulthood for a lot of things in Japan is 20, although some of that has been changed to 18. But there's there's just how rookie contracts are structured, uh, whether clubs are doing enough to push for bigger fees, for sell-on fees, which is, I think, maybe the safer way to go about it, um, because I think that you can, in, in some cases, make more on a good sell-on fee than you will from an initial fee. Um, that There is a culture of players who want to go to Europe, especially if they have the talent to do so, they will sign with the club that will let them accomplish that. It is in many cases the only ways that smaller clubs can sign good players because Ural Reds can sign, they can afford to sign a star Japanese player for a million euros. But say Shonan Belmare, who can only maybe afford a quarter of that or half of that, they can tell Wataru Endo, for example, if you want to go to Europe, we will not stand in your way. We're not going to. You know, if you if we get a respectable offer, we will step. We will rubber stamp it. Um, I mean, Wataru Endo went to Urawa before he went to uh, Germany, but like just just as as a representative example, that is how small clubs here have to exist. Uh, but the J League is aware that this is an issue. I, I've spoken with current and former officials. I mean, this is something everyone recognizes is a problem. They just haven't have been able to deal with it. Uh, in the way that they would have liked over the last couple of years because they've been focusing on the pandemic. Mm. And, and that's been a much more pressing 
uh, matter, but it's going to happen. Uh, so I, w- I would expect clubs to be more aggressive in terms of how they negotiate going forward. And Vissel Kobe, I think uh, they're, they're, they know the game. I think that we saw that with how Kyogo was handled. Uh, if I were to put a rough, I, I am sort of feeling one and a half million euros for Kobayashi, maybe two somewhere. I, and I could be totally off. I, I just, my gut instinct right now is that that's where that number is going to land. But again, that'd be pretty decent business again from Celtic's perspective. Right. And it, again, when, when you're looking, yeah. when you're looking at a guy who's, who's 22, much like Rio Hitati in terms of there's going to be development in him and Daisy Maeda, as you say, the, the first step might be to put on that sale on clause because if he does get that that big move elsewhere, um, maybe after a couple of years, and you said in one of your tweets, Dan, that he'll probably be looking at representing Japan in 2026 um, at the the next major tournament, um, the World Cup, that that might be the way to start it. But that's quite interesting to just kind of get that perspective on the whole structure of the J League and Japanese football at this time of uh, transfer fees. Just to kind of wrap up on, on, on Yuki Kobayashi, what do you expect him to bring to the Celtic team? I see he's a left-sided Defender, you, you've mentioned that he probably will suit Ange Postecoglou's system in terms of his um, defense, d- defensive passing. Ange Postecoglou consistently speaks about, you know, the defensive players giving the the forwards and midfielders this kind of this mm-hmm. platform to attack. He seems pretty suited to this, and I also see that his his sports agency um, UDN is the same as as you scared the Gucci. So there's been contact there. But what do you expect Tim to to give Celtic? I, I brought this up in in my thread, but he's uh, pretty close to uh, Cameron Carter Vickers in terms of a couple of his uh, in terms of a couple of his stats and what he and what he would bring uh, to the club. I believe it was um, in ball recoveries, you know, so you can see like that 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 speaks to to where he is as a pressing defender. Uh, in terms of losing, if uh, lose the number of times he loses the ball again, he, he would rank pretty favorable uh, with Carter Vickers, and, and I think that you're going to see. You know, he's not going to be a goal scorer. Like he's not going to be in. Yeah, you know, he. I don't. He's not a box to box center back. I don't quite see him in that. I think he, you're going to see him going from. I think the Celtic third, and then the the middle third. Um, I think that's where he's going to spend the most time. Uh, I don't know if he's going to walk on, to, walk into the starting lineup. I think it's it's way too early to tell, but he may need some time uh, just in the practice squad to get used to things. But I, I think that he overall has a lot of upside. Uh, the raw skills are there. The potential is there. It, it, if it works out, we're going to, you know, Ange will look like a genius, not that he doesn't already, but it, it seems like a very good move on paper all around. But I think that if it does work out, then everyone can be very happy. Yeah, and I'll be very happy that I've been served this chat a few hours after that it broke. Um, but yeah, it's one that I'm looking forward to if it does go through. And also see, you know, he's played 31 times in the league this season. I think it's 40 appearances overall. He seems consistent in that. And Celtic have had, obviously, those defensive issues this season. Dan, in terms of players picking up injuries, Carol Starfield being out for a long period of time. Stephen Welsh has been in and out. Um, and Moritz Jens has yet to, to sign a permanent deal with Celtic. So pretty interesting looking at it from a Celtic perspective that, you know, bringing in this left-sided centre half, what that maybe means for some of the other guys. Um, but as you say, coming in at, 22 will he be a first team starter we, we don't know as of yet but I thought it was quite interesting just going back to what you said earlier and that he might come in um, pretty soon at Celtic and try and just get used to his surroundings early before you know the, the, the deal's even done come over here get settled into life in Glasgow Lennox Town and participate in the training um, so that'd be good for him in a sense to, to get here and just see what his surroundings are like I, I would I think that if it's possible it'd be great to see him join the squad down in Australia that's mm. coming up in November yeah it seems like a, a good a good way for him to sort of meet the team and, and to get used to things but again I mean there's there's the visa situation there um I, I will say if you're looking in terms of his developmental scale 
the next, or I should say Japan's next major tournament uh, will be the Asian Cup. Uh, okay. And because that was awarded to Qatar and because Qatar is incapable of running tournaments in June and July, as we have seen, uh, that's likely to take place in, uh, I think, from January, late January 2024 okay. is when they're thinking about starting that. So not great news if you're a Celtic fan uh, looking at the possibility of several of your players being absent uh, when the season resumes because the Asian Cup is obviously a continental competition and uh, Celtic would be obliged to honor any call-ups. Uh, but he'll be 23 by then, uh, close to 24. Uh, he'll have had a possible year of, of first-team time with Celtic, and I think if you're looking at bringing him up as the next generation of defenders, which Japan does sorely need, that's one going to be one of the big landmarks in terms of where he's developing as a national team player. So he'll have a year. And I think that how he spends this next year is going to be very important. That's that's an interesting one to keep our eyes out for. Um, I wasn't too aware of that one. And as you say, um, if Celtic have got a few out with injuries, that could be a bit of an issue then. But we'll cross that bridge whenever we come to it. Um, but we're doing this podcast before um, Hajime Moriyasu announces his squad for the World Cup. I just wanted to briefly get your, your thoughts, Dan, before we finished up. I, I see your tweets all the time. You get inundated of why he's not picking Rio Hitati. Um But what is your gut feeling on this at this point in time? Before the squad's announced, is he going to the World Cup? Yes or no? For Hatate? Yeah. I hate to say it, but no but. And so to explain why, the why of why Hatate is, isn't getting chosen. I mean, the, the, the problem is that he is such, he is a great utility midfielder. He can go anywhere. He can do anything. Mm -hmm. He's, he's your Swiss army knife. And, and he, he is, when he is on point, he is the glue that holds the, the attacking formation together and just connects all these passes. But due to the circumstances of the last couple of years, uh, Moriyasu did not have the time to integrate him into the national team setup that he would have had without the pandemic. I think that without COVID, uh, Hatate makes a splash at the Olympics, and then he has two years to integrate into the national team, and then he's chosen. Uh, but if you look at Japan's midfielders, they're really good. Mina Mino, who, okay, you know, when he's in form, he's in form. Mm -hmm. Takefu who is doing really well with Real Sociedad this season. Kaoru Mitoma, who's doing really well for Brighton this season. Um, Junya Ito on the right wing. Ritsu Dohan. Uh, you have more defensively Al Tanaka. Hidemasa Morita. Wataru Endo is a more cent you know, central midfielder. These are a lot of good midfielders. I can go on and on. There's five or six mm. people I haven't named yet, and, and they're all in the mix. And that that's before you get into players like Shoya Nakajima, who has sort of fallen off the face of the earth, but should be it, it, it should be a dark horse for this World Cup squad, and, and by in, in many people's opinions, should have it should be in this World Cup squad. Uh, so that Hatate is unfortunately sort of a victim of the fact that Japan is really good at raising midfielders. Mm. Uh, and I would love to see him go instead of, say, Gaku Shibasaki, who has sort of disappeared in the Spanish second division, but he has the experience... Uh, at the World Cup for this national team. And, and so I think that Moriyasu is going to lean on him and players like Genki Haraguchi. Those are the ones who are going to get sort of the veterans call-ups. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but uh, having said all that, if there is a surprise selection, it will be Reo Hatate. Hmm. And we don't know what there's going to be a surprise selection, but somehow Japan always does manage to pull maybe one, maybe two on us. And, and 
I think a lot of people would love to see it. Yeah, I, I would certainly love to see it. I think, you know, we, we touched on earlier that he's only really been playing professional football for two years. I think he's gave a pretty decent account of himself um, in the Champions League when he's been up against some really top, top midfielders there. Uh, I was in the, the post-match after the Shakhtar game. Danny looked really, really down himself. He was going for walks around the park. Um, it's a really isolated figure. Just to think he maybe knew in himself he hadn't given what he probably thought he could have. Um, but Kubo's one I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, the World Cup. I've watched him for Real Sociedad down at Old Trafford and the Europa League. Really, really impressed by him. What I'm looking forward to seeing. As you can tell, with Scotland not being there and with the jersey behind me, there's only going to be one natural team for me to support at this World Cup. Um, and, and that is that is if looking closer. I, I mean, I thought that was just the regular kid. That's the uh, the that's the anime kid, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, I thought it was quite cool. Uh, I couldn't resist. And after, I think it was one of these ones that either you know Daisy made and scored a, a scream or a goal or something, or Kyogo scored a hat trick. I, I think I went on and, and bought it in one of those. Kind of impulse buys. I actually might have been after the the Derby game when Hatati scored the two goals. I will tell you if that kit was actually licensed, it would probably cost you about two or three hundred pounds, given how many different production companies are represented there. Mm. Yeah. Um, just finally, uh, Daisy made a Kyogo. You do expect to be in World Cup squad, yeah? Kyogo, yes. Dies in probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in terms I of that, yeah. I noticed the kind of in the last uh, the games when they played in Germany, I noticed might have been playing played up top. Would you think that was just to experiment a wee bit, or you know, in terms of just looking at both, who do you expect to play the most most games at World Cup? Kyogo or Dyson? I would expect. I want to say Kyogo. Um... So in those games in Germany, Moriasu did start uh, four different midfielders, or sorry, four different forwards uh, for 45 minutes each. He gave, them, he gave them each a half. And none of them really impressed, if we're being honest. I just realized that, of course, I going through the midfielders, I didn't mention Daichi Kamara, who is, of course, probably Japan's best uh, attacking midfielder at the moment. But going back to the forward conversation, um, I think that, Everyone who has followed this Japan side came to the reluctant conclusion that Yuya Osako is probably the best fitted to this setup uh, because I think Kyogo or Daizen, they're waiting in the final third for you to get them the ball. And once you get them the ball, they will be fine. Uh, But the way that this formation of this squad is set up, you do need a, a, a forward who can come back and participate in the build up and then move up and score. And that's, that's Yuyo Sako's strength. And he has come back from injury and he has looked okay. Uh, so for our sins, I think that that's what we're going to get. Uh, but you never know. Um, injuries happen. What could, pull a fast one on us. I, I would expect the Kyogo will probably have an edge, but if you're, especially as this World, World Cup will have five substitutes uh, per mm-hmm. game, there are easily scenarios where in the last 10, 15 minutes, you just want Daizen to go in and go all out. Um, that's when you need your assassin and that's when you call him up. And uh, I think that both of them have very good chances of getting getting some playing time at this World Cup. Yeah, I'm hoping not too much playing time at the World Cup, just because too much playing time, Dan, will obviously attract attention. And um, as a Celtic fan, you probably don't want them getting too much. Um, so, absolutely, I'm absolutely fine with, with Dyson maybe coming on for the last ten minutes in games and, and doing that job, which you know he can do so well. To wrap up, you scared Gucci? Do you see him making an impact at Celtic, Dan? He's been one who I felt really, really sorry for. He came in, played that Scottish Cup tie against Alawa, got injured, came back and looked towards the, the back end of last season. Played in, came on against Mullerwell, looked very good, featured a wee bit in pre-season. Then the injury came again. I think it's just about him getting a clean slate in terms of injury-free and then trying to, to knock on the door. But a lot of people would maybe have thought that with Callum McGregor being out, that would have been the chance. And then obviously Celtic went and signed uh, Oliver Abelgaard from 
from Kazan and that kind of loan spell. Do you expect Adaguchi to make a, an impact this season? Not really. I mean, I think he was the biggest question mark of the three, uh, of those three New Year signings that they made. And as I said earlier, there's a lot of upside to that, but you can't have upside without downside. And it, it just, if he can stay healthy and start getting some minutes, you can maybe turn that around, but uh, that's going to depend wholly on whether Ange sees something and decides to give him some time. So I'm, I'm pessimistic, but I'm not willing to write him off completely yet. That's a fair comment. Dan, as always, thank you for joining me. It's the first opportunity I've had to speak with you um, after following you on Twitter for so long. So it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Um, we'll see how this story develops with Yuki Kobayashi. Um, if he does sign that permanent deal, we'll maybe get you back on to get your thoughts on the deal. Um, but all I can really say is thank you for, for giving up your time for Celtics are here. It's been a pleasure to, to chat to you. Thank you for having me. It's great talking to you. Um, I appreciate you and all of my other Twitter followers in, in the Celtic sphere. And, and it's, uh, it's great to see these players continue to have this impact. And it's been really fun to watch this Scotland-Japan relationship develop over the last uh, year and a half. And uh, long may it continue. Yeah, absolutely. Long may it continue. So, Dan, thanks for joining me on the Celtics Are Here podcast. Thank you.